Life's journey is often met with storms that threaten to derail our faith and darken our hope. Yet nestled within these trials is the promise of a divine turnaround, a metamorphosis orchestrated by God when we lay our trust in Him. The theme of trust is a profound one. It's the golden thread that weaves through the tapestry of our relationship with God. Trust is the vessel that carries us through the tempests of life into the harbors of divine grace and transformation. In the heart of adversity, it may seem as though the heavens are silent and the tapestry of our lives is unraveling. Yet there lies an eternal promise in Jeremiah 32:17, where it's proclaimed, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. This verse isn't just merely a collection of words, but a living testament of God's boundless power and His ability to transcend the laws of nature, to mend the unmendable, to restore the irreplaceable. The essence of a divine turnaround begins when we anchor our trust in God, allowing His Word to be the compass that navigates us through the thickets of despair and uncertainty. It's about delving into a narrative larger than our own, where God is the author, intricately penning down each chapter with a purpose, even when the plot seems to be veiled in mystery. In the arena of faith, trust is our shield and God's word is our sword. Embracing the word of God is akin to planting seeds of faith in the fertile soil of our hearts. As these seeds sprout, they burgeon into robust trees of hope their roots delving deep into the spiritual reservoir of God's promises, their branches reaching out towards the heavens, as if in a silent yet profound chorus of trust. Imagine your life as a canvas. Each stroke of adversity is but a part of a divine masterpiece that God is crafting. When we trust Him, we're handing over the brush to the master artist allowing him to turn the seemingly disjointed and dark strokes into a masterpiece imbued with purpose and hope. Let's delve into the reservoir of faith. Let the living waters of God's word rejuvenate our trust and witness the divine orchestration of turnaround in our lives. As we embark on this spiritual voyage, let's be still and know that he is God and he is in the business of turning things around molding trials into testimonies, sorrows into joy when we trust in Him. The beauty of trust is that it unveils the divine narrative where God is the central character, always ready, always able to turn things around for our good. The profound truth is, the storm isn't your ending. It's merely a passage, a passage that invites you to witness the miraculous hand of God as He calms the storm and navigates you to the shores of hope. It's in the heart of these adversities that God's promise rings true. For Psalm 91, 4 reminds us, He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. It's an invitation to replace fear with faith, uncertainty with trust, Every challenge you face is an opportunity for God to manifest His unyielding love and power in your life. It's a divine dance that unfolds as you step back and allow God to lead. As Proverbs 3, 5-6 urges, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. When the world trembles beneath your feet, when the skies are overcast with despair, it's a clarion call to cast your gaze heavenward, to trust in God whose love is steadfast, whose power is unmatched, and whose wisdom is unsearchable. It's not a blind trust, but a faith rooted in the character of God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As you traverse through the seasons of life, with each high and low, May your heart find solace in the absolute trust in God. The journey might be fraught with trials, yet with every step taken in faith, watch as the master of the universe meticulously turns things around. With eyes fixed on God, behold the unfolding of a divine narrative that turns ashes into beauty, despair into hope, 
and trials into testimonies. So, dear friends, amidst life's unforeseeable twists and turns, let's anchor our trust in God. Witness the awe-inspiring, life-transforming power of trust as God orchestrates a symphony of grace that turns your life into a testament of His unfailing love and power. Remember, in the realm of trust, God moves mightily. And in the theater of faith, the impossible becomes possible. Consider a mighty oak tree. It stands tall, not because it's above the adversities of weather, but because it's deeply rooted in a foundation that holds it firm, come rain or shine. Similarly, our trust in God is that deep-rooted foundation that holds us strong amidst the adversities of life. The more we trust, the stronger and deeper our roots grow into the love and faithfulness of God. Our faith can be likened to a small mustard seed, which when planted, grows into a larger tree. The Bible says in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. This is the potential of a trusting heart. With trusting God, we can move the mountains of fear, doubt, and anxiety that often block our path. Now envision a potter at work, meticulously shaping and molding the clay at his wheel. Each spin of the wheel, each touch of his hands, transforms the lump of clay into a vessel of purpose and beauty. Our lives are like that clay, and God is the divine potter. As we trust Him, He molds our circumstances, turning trials into testimonies, fears into faith, and pain into purpose. God's Word in Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. When we trust God, we align ourselves with His divine craftsmanship, allowing Him to turn around every situation for our good. Our trust is the catalyst for divine turnaround. Imagine a painter before a canvas. With every stroke of his brush, he brings color, form, and narrative to what was once a blank space. Our trust in God invites Him to paint the canvas of our lives with strokes of grace, mercy, in love, turning the blank spaces of our despair into beautiful landscapes of hope and promise. When we trust God, we unlock a peace that surpasses understanding, a joy that overflows, and a hope that is steadfast. As we lean on Him amidst the chaos, watch how He turns things around, painting our lives with the vibrant colors of His love and faithfulness leading us through paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Our trust is not in vain. It's the doorway to divine turnaround. So let's anchor our hearts in trust and watch in awe as God turns things around, leading us to calm shores and bright days ahead. The narrative of Abraham and Sarah is a testament to the power of unwavering trust. The barrenness that seemed like an endless curse was but a prelude to the miraculous birth of Isaac. The long wait was not a void. It was a sacred space where trust was nurtured, faith was reaffirmed, and patience was cultivated. Every passing moment was a step towards the divine promise that was to manifest in God's perfect timing. The poignant tale of Jabez, too, resonates with the essence of trust. His life, once synonymous with sorrow, witnessed a dawn of joy when he entrusted his cause to the divine. The prayer of Jabez, a cry from the depths of despair, reached the heavens, and the response was a life reimagined, a destiny rewritten. The crucible of trust is often heated by the flames of adversity, yet it's within this crucible that our faith is purified, our hope is fortified, and our spirits are invigorated. As mentioned in 1 Peter 5.7, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. It's a divine invitation to lay down our burdens at His feet and to witness how intricately and beautifully He orchestrates the symphony of our life. The metaphor of John 16.21, where the anguish of a woman in labor is juxtaposed with the joy of birth, 
encapsulates the essence of our trials. The pain endured is ephemeral, but the joy that follows is eternal. It's a gentle reminder that on the other side of our enduring patience lies a realm of endless joy and divine blessings. Our journey may sometimes be strewn with thorns of doubt, fear, and impatience. Yet amidst this thorny path lies the rose of God's promise, waiting to bloom in the garden of our trust. As Psalm 56, 8 illustrates, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Every tear shed, every prayer whispered, is accounted for in the divine ledger. Our communication with God through prayers and reflections is not a monologue, but a dialogue. It's an avenue to pour out our hearts, to vocalize our fears, and to affirm our trust. This divine dialogue strengthens our resolve, clears our vision, and deepens our trust. The hardships you face, the unknown that looms, they're not dead ends, but detours orchestrated by God to lead you to your destiny. Each trial is an opportunity for trust. It's not about a blind leap into the void, but a knowing step into the light of God's love. Every situation, no matter how bleak, holds a silver lining, a divine blueprint awaiting the trust-filled eyes to discern. God's promises are not mere platitudes, but power-packed truths. They're not just to be read, but to be lived, to be anchored in. Here's a gentle nudge to dive into the scripture, to make it your dwelling place. Let the word of God be your compass, leading you through the fog of uncertainty into the clarity of God's plan. As you navigate through the daily chores, the highs and lows, embed your heart and trust, water it with the word, and watch how God turns your barren lands into blooming gardens. In times when the world around crumbles, when every other ground sinks, remember that trusting in God is standing on solid rock. It's relinquishing control. It's allowing God to steer your boat through the storm towards the shores of His perfect will. As you step into each day, each moment, hold fast to this transcendent truth. God is in control. And when you trust Him, watch how He turns things around, manifesting His glorious plans in your life. Your situation is not the end of your story. Rather, it's the start of a wonderful testimony covered with God's faithfulness. And if you agree, then shout Amen in the comments area below. If you've gotten this far and you feel that things will continue to improve in your life, Please let us know by liking and subscribing to the channel. It's a tiny step for you, but it goes a long way. God bless you. If you're a Christian navigating through a season of challenge and change in your life, this message is for you. Today, I'm going to share some signs that God might be using this season of your life to prune you for a more fantastic future He'll bring you into. We'll explore how God sometimes prunes us to make us more fruitful and ready for His purposes. But then, how can we recognize when God is pruning us? What are the benefits of trusting God in the midst of our pruning process? What should you do when God prunes you? I trust God to help us find the strength and encouragement to stand strong through this message today, in Jesus' name. Friends, life is full of changes. Some changes may be positive and exciting, such as getting married, having a baby, starting a new job, or moving to a new place. In contrast, some changes might be negative and painful, such as losing a loved one, getting divorced, being fired, or facing a health crisis. Some changes may be neutral and inevitable, such as growing older, changing seasons, or shifting trends. But whether we like it or not, change is necessary for our growth and development. Change helps us learn new things, develop new skills, discover new opportunities, and adapt to new situations. 
In fact, change often helps you discover things you never knew you could become or do. Change also helps us to become more like Christ, who's our perfect model, both in our spiritual journey and in our life here on earth. Let me show you something from three verses of scripture to further clarify this. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 1 John 2.6 says, Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. And chapter 4.17 adds, This is how love is made complete among us, that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. But how does change help us to become more like Christ in this world? The answer is through God's pruning. In gardening, pruning is the process of cutting away unwanted or unproductive parts of a plant to improve its health, shape, and yield. Pruning is also a metaphor for how God works in our lives to remove anything that hinders us from bearing fruit for His glory. But before we dive into the divine aspect of pruning, let's take a moment to really ponder on and appreciate how life unfolds. You see, we all go through various stages of change, from seed to bud, to blossom, and finally, to fruit. These stages parallel our spiritual journey. Hence, sometimes, when life throws its curveballs, it's a sign that we're at a stage of change that God has ordained. Jesus said in John 15, 1-2, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit He prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. In this passage, we can see how Jesus compares Himself to a vine and every genuine believer to branches. He says that His Father, who's the gardener, prunes every branch that bears fruit so that it'll be even more fruitful. This means that God sometimes allows or causes changes in our lives that may seem painful or difficult at first, but are meant to help us grow and produce more fruit. What kind of fruit are we talking about? The Bible tells us in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of God's presence and work in our lives. It's the result of being connected to Jesus, who is the source of life. The fruit of the working of the Spirit in us is also a way we glorify God and bless others around us. I believe that no matter how introverted or how social you are, you want to honor God and bless those around you in a notable way. Beloved, God also has the same desire. In fact, it's the same reason He's taking you through what you're going through now. Have you ever observed a skilled gardener at work or worked in a garden yourself? Pruning is a crucial aspect of this work. Just like a gardener prunes plants to foster better growth, God prunes us to prepare us for more. It's not always what we expect, but how can we recognize when God is pruning us? Here are some signs that God may be pruning you to prepare you for more. One, you experience loss or disappointment. God may prune you by taking away something or someone that you love or value. This may be a relationship, a job, a dream, a possession, or anything else that you hold dear. This may seem cruel or unfair, but you must believe that God has a higher purpose for your loss. He may want you to depend on Him more than anything else. He may want you to learn something new or important. Or He may just be clearing up space to make room for something better coming into your life. If you don't know this, you may think He hates you or doesn't want you to be happy, but that's not true. If you don't believe anything else, believe that His thoughts of you are good thoughts to give you a great future. Everything He does or will do in your life is aimed at achieving that. 2. You face challenges or difficulties. God may prune you by allowing you to go through trials or hardships. This may be a health issue, a financial problem, a family conflict, 
a personal struggle, or anything else that causes you stress or pain. It often seems overwhelming to deal with hardships that seem to have no ending. However, no matter how overwhelming or hopeless it feels, God has something better for you than this crisis in your life. Challenges or difficult times help us grow stronger and wiser. God will often use them to help us develop some skills or qualities and overcome the enemy's obstacles in our lives. 3. You feel uncomfortable or dissatisfied. This is a crucial one. It often happens when God's about to take you to the next level. He starts by disrupting your status quo. This may be a change of environment, a change of perspective, a change of direction, or anything else that causes you discomfort or dissatisfaction. Because we easily get used to our comfort zone, this may be unsettling or confusing at first, but there's more in your future and God's about to bring you into it. Hear what his word says in Proverbs 23:18. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. God may be disrupting your status quo to explore new possibilities or opportunities. He may be driving you to discover new passions or gifts and pursue new goals. Whatever it is and wherever it may be in your life right now, know that these are some of the signs that you're being prepared. Don't get discouraged. Your future will be greater than your past. Your future will be brighter than your present. Don't give up. Don't give in. And don't give out. Of course, there may be other signs that only God knows and understands. The important thing is to trust Him and His wisdom in all things. He knows what He's doing, and He has your best interests at heart. Joseph's story beautifully illustrates God's pruning process. It's a testament to how God prunes us for greater things. Joseph was sold into slavery, wrongly accused and imprisoned. But through his unwavering faith in God's plan, he emerged as a wise and powerful ruler in Egypt, saving his family and countless others from the famine that ravaged the earth in his days. In today's world, we often find ourselves facing daunting challenges, struggles and setbacks. It's easy to question why God would allow these hardships. But my friends, these moments of adversity might just be the signs that God is pruning you for something extraordinary. As Christians, we believe in a God who knows the plans He has for us. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans for a future and hope. Therefore, our perspective as God's children is built on faith and trust even when life seems to be falling apart. So, the signs of pruning are actually opportunities for growth in our faith and character, not attempts to destroy us. So when you find yourself in the middle of a storm, remember that God is with you. Your challenges are not punishments, but the refining fire that shapes your character. As Romans 5, 3-4 tells us, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Beloved, your trials are building your character for a greater purpose. Ultimately, you must remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When you see these signs of pruning around you, turn to Him. Hold on to Jesus as the constant, unwavering anchor in the storm. He is the one who will guide you through life's trials and prepare you for more. I encourage you to hold steadfast to your faith and prayerfully trust that God is working for your good. Surround yourself with godly friends who can support you and pray for you. Share your struggles and questions with them and let them help you find answers. Listen to their advice and encouragement from God's Word. You can also personally find verses that speak to your situation and comfort your soul. Memorize them and repeat them when you feel confused or discouraged. Apply them to your life and your situation. With His guidance, you'll emerge from this season stronger, wiser, and ready for the extraordinary future that awaits you. 
God's promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you is found in multiple books of the Bible, in both the Old and New Testaments. With this promise, we can be assured that He is always with us and encouraged to always be with God in faith and spirit. It is a given fact that sometimes in life we want to give up. It is then when life makes no sense. We want to throw in the towel and call it quits. From our job, school, church, and sometimes businesses. That's because the burdens, trials, and afflictions of life can become so overwhelming that the easiest thing, or the thing that requires the least effort that one can humanly think about in the middle of such a great test of faith, is to give up. What you've been going through are admittedly some strange times. There is a tremendous turbulence going on at every level, and many are falling away through apostasy while mothers are weeping for their dying babies. But despite everything, you cannot give up now. Let this serve as good news that God did not bring you to this point to leave you. You've come a long way on this journey, and you've made it thus far, not because of the absence of danger, but by faith and God's presence with you. In the book of Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. After 40 long and tragic years in the wilderness, seeing miraculous provision and protection and also justice and discipline, the Israelites are on the cusp of entering into that good land promised by God when He rescued them with His mighty hand and His outstretched arm. Moses is not to be the one to take them in. His successor, Joshua, will carry the responsibility forth into what is the next chapter of redemptive history. Moses is commissioning Joshua in these verses, and verse 8 follows the iconic, Be strong and courageous. This verse speaks volumes about God's heart for you and His determination to help you see Him as He really is. Not only is He always ahead of you carving out a path you are to travel on, but He is able to walk with you as you go through your intimate trials. He is telling you that there is no reason to be afraid or discouraged because He's not going to abandon you. He has everything under control, and all that is going to happen will happen under His watchful eye. Even today, when we face life-altering changes in our life, these same words that were once spoken to comfort people struggling with the changes they were facing are the same words God is using to calm our fears and anxieties. It is always His intention for us to walk in His peace as we walk in Him. Child of God, He has not brought you to this level to leave you stranded. That is not the agenda of God. The intention of God for your life's journey is a safe arrival. Isaiah 41.10 So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is aware of your tendency to fear, and He cares about every fear you face. In the Bible, we find commands and encouragements to not feel fear, take courage, fear not, and more. These appear over 300 times. God doesn't want us to be consumed by fear. And yet, our fears do not surprise Him in the least. We need to realize God is not disappointed in us when we have fears. No more than you are disappointed when one of your children is afraid. The promise of God to hold your hand is a promise of assured guidance. The reason why the unmanned missile launchers are so efficient is because of their ability to hit the exact targets that are fed into their software. Without external factors interrupting its flight path, a missile launcher will hit its target a hundred times out of a hundred trials. As long as the coordinates do not change, the missile will always hit it. That is the way the promise of God works. Every time we act upon His promises and covenants with us, the end is always predictable. You will reach your destination in pristine health and under the full protection of God. It reached a point in the history of the Israelites and their sojourn in slavery in Egypt 
that their suffering and sorrowful prayers were heard by God, and He sent them a Savior and Deliverer to lead them out of Egypt into a land He had planned for them. The story of the suffering of the Israelites in Egypt is documented in the book of Exodus. The men were forced to do backbreaking manual labors that the Egyptians wouldn't do. Their wives and children were used as slaves and servants to their lords and masters, the Egyptians. All these with very little care and attention. God saw their suffering and consecrated a man to go into Egypt and liberate them. After leaving the land of Egypt, they arrived in front of the Red Sea. Now Pharaoh and his army were riding after the Israelites to kill them for leaving the land. And here they are before the Red Sea. If they go forward, they will drown. If they turn back, Pharaoh and his army will kill them, and the rest will be returned back into worse labor. It seemed that God had brought them out of Egypt, out of captivity, into certain death and annihilation. But in the same book of Exodus 14.13, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The end of this story in history has remained one of the single most astounding acts of God. A reference miracle was wrought on this day, the Red Sea was parted, and the ranks of the Egyptian army were destroyed in the sea. Hear me, child of God. God is not a God of coincidences and assumptions. He is a very particular God. God's plans for you are particular to you, and carry the end from the beginning. He has never left anybody who leaves Him in charge stranded on their own. Never. God made a path through the sea. The guiding cloud moved behind them and settled down upon the Egyptians, creating a zero-visibility fog. The pillar of fire lit the scene for Israel, and that night they made their escape. We sometimes find ourselves in tight positions with no possible avenues of escape. Your whole human mind comes to its wit's end many times. You run out of ideas and your brain seems to take a break at the highest level of stress. Having God on your side is the only advantage you can have, because He always delivers. One with God is always the majority. After the death of Moses, God chose Joshua, the son of Nun, to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land. Joshua was a warrior from a clan of fighters, but the responsibility of leading God's people was a huge task. The book of Joshua in the first chapter contains God's admonishments to Joshua. Call it an orientation speech if you may. But in Joshua 1.9, God makes a promise to Joshua as he takes up the mantle of leading Israel on his way into the Promised Land. God says, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Be neither thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. The children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness for forty years, and it was up to Joshua to lead them into the Promised Land. He'd have to claim the land from its current inhabitants, fight and lead battles, and provide spiritual leadership for a large group of people. As he was feeling the overwhelming weight of the task before him, the Lord offered those words of encouragement. Many times, before you take a trip, you make extensive plans. Hotels, lodging, feeding, money, your routes, and all documents as the case may be. You have the opportunity to plan an awesome trip, and most times they would turn out great, and with the most little hitches. Even though many times as humans, plans would change and things would go sideways. In Joshua's case, he didn't have all the answers to the challenges before him, but he was counseled to go forward anyway, acting in faith. Like Joshua, we seldom have all the answers to our personal challenges, but God promises that when we turn to Him for guidance, we will succeed. God is all-powerful and all-knowing. 
He has the answers and the strength we need to face any challenge before us. He was with Joshua, and he will be with us. God has not brought you this far to leave you stranded, not at this juncture. His words to us, always in the Bible and through other media, have been of great plans for us. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah 29.11, God declares His awesome plans for you. This passage in the book of Jeremiah has become the bedrock for the promises and covenant of God's dealings with you over time and through to your destiny. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Satan often uses the circumstances of our lives to bring doubt concerning God's love. If God really loved you, why would he allow you to experience this suffering or sorrow? Why would he leave you to face these challenges alone? This often happens when we have failed in our Christian walk and we have been disobedient to the commands of God. We hate ourselves for the weakness of our flesh and when things are not going according to the way they should be going. Many times we are hit with hard luck after hard luck. It seems we cannot catch a break Everything seems to just go out of control. We are very disappointed with ourselves, and we thus presume that God is also disappointed and angry with us. God is not disappointed in you. No, He is not. Instead, God is seeking to come into a closer union, all for your own good, to deliver you to a perfect ending. In the book of Psalms 118.6, the psalmist says, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? This should become your attitude immediately you get the light that God is on your side and He will never leave you. There's a sense of security when you know that your plans are secured and fail-proof. Jesus is the fail-proof destiny plan and partner you are looking for because He has promised not to leave you nor forsake you. How do you confirm that you are in God's will and doing what He wants you to do? In this video, I will share a few things with you to help you know what God wants you to do. This message is for children of God and anyone who wants to have a relationship with God. God can use anyone to serve His purposes, but He is only committed to supporting and preserving those whose hearts trust in Him. We can learn this from the story of King Asa of Judah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, God told Asa, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. But what led to this moment in Asa's life? Why did God say these words to him? Asa had lived trusting God and seeking only to do those things God wanted him to do, and God was there to help him. However, when he took matters into his own hands and didn't trust God for support and direction, he opened himself up to an era of struggles. Don't forget the purpose of this video is to show you how to know what God wants you to do. So, pay attention, my friend. King Asa was a ruler of Judah who had done many good things in the Lord's eyes. He had removed the idols and altars of foreign gods from his land and had commanded his people to seek the Lord their God with all their heart. He had also built up the defenses of Judah and had defeated a large army of Ethiopians who had invaded his territory. However, in the later years of his reign, he became unfaithful to the Lord. He faced a new threat from Basha, the king of Israel, who attacked Judah and fortified Ramah, a city near Jerusalem. Basha wanted to cut off all trade and communication between Judah and the outside world. Instead of relying on the Lord for help, Asa decided to make an alliance with Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, an enemy of Israel. He sent Ben-Hadad silver and gold from the temple of God in the palace and asked him to break his treaty with Basha and attack him from behind. Ben-Hadad agreed and sent his troops to raid several towns in Israel. This forced Basha to stop building Ramah and retreat to his own land. Asa then took advantage of this situation and gathered all the men of Judah to carry away the stones and timber that Basha had used to fortify Ramah. He used them to strengthen his own cities of Geba and Mizpah. 
You could look at this situation and applaud Asa for thinking outside the box and using his enemy's ally against him. However, Asa's actions displeased God, and he sent a prophet named Hanani to rebuke him for having more faith in a human king than in the Lord. Remember that Asa took sacred treasures from God's temple as gifts to appeal to a man without considering God. The prophet Hanani reminded him of how the Lord had delivered him from a much stronger army when he relied on God. He also told them that because he had done this foolish thing, he would face wars for the rest of his life. Asa was angry with Hanani for telling him the truth. He was so enraged that he put him in prison and also oppressed some of his people. He refused to repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness for what he had done. Asa then fell ill and suffered from a disease in his feet that became very severe. Still, instead of turning to the Lord for healing, Asa turned only to human doctors. Eventually, Asa died after ruling for 41 years, and though he was buried with great honor in Jerusalem, he left behind a legacy of unfaithfulness and disobedience to the Lord. Dear Saint, a simple action of unbelief in God or a stubborn refusal to seek God's will for your life can result in a costly mistake that can affect a person for the rest of their lives. God's words through the mouth of his servant Hanani still echo to us today. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. God is always looking to strengthen and help those whose hearts are committed to Him. Those whose hearts are always asking, Is this what God wants? Will this honor Him? Is this what He wants me to do? Am I where He wants me to be? God says that He is committed to them as they are to Him. This should also tell you that when you neglect what God wants you to do, you should not expect Him to show you commitment. Yes, He will love you regardless of what you do. He will receive you when you turn to Him in repentance. However, just like Asa and the prodigal son, as long as you stay away, you will remain apart from the benefits of God's commitment to those who are faithful to Him. Now, as we go about our daily business, because we are often engrossed with so many things, waiting to know what God wants us to do is becoming increasingly difficult. Let's be honest. It's easier to ask and wait to know what God wants you to do when you are not under any pressure or when you have your needs met. It becomes difficult when you are under intense pressure and the options before you look like they will solve all your problems. Asa found himself in a similar situation with King Basha. Up until this moment, he sought after and did those things that God wanted. But the moment Basha attacked, Asa wouldn't take the risk of seeking what God wanted or waiting until he showed up. Asa probably thought that his plans were going to save his people. And since that was a good thing to do as king, he believed God wanted it. However, God doesn't work like that, my friend. You see, although something looks good, it does not guarantee that it will be acceptable before God. That something is nice and favorable to you or to others doesn't mean that God approves of it for you. His word says in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 9, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In these verses, God is saying, you need to find out what my will for you is. You need to seek my face, my child. Leave unhealthy thinking of self-dependence alone. Turn to me and I will show you mercy. My ways are different from yours. Although your ways seem right, they're not always going to lead to the right places. However, my own plans and thoughts always lead to the right places. Maybe you are watching this right now and asking yourself, how do I know what God wants me to do? What do I have to do to know His will for me? Here are two key ways to know what God wants you to do. Number one, you can know what God wants you to do by waiting on Him in prayer and fasting. Dear saints, fasting and prayer are still a thing and still they work. When you pray, you admit your dependence on God. It is not safe for you to jump into everything because you feel like it or because you can. Waiting on God in prayer is making sure that you ask Him for guidance regarding your next action. 
One mistake we often make is to pray during or after we have made the decision. We often say, Lord, if it isn't your will, don't let this work. But if it is your will, let me prosper. This may work in a few cases, but it isn't the best way. You should pause and wait for God's answer while you pray. And one of the best ways to do this is to pray while fasting. During fasting, you deny yourself things that normally give you pleasure and excitement. Possibly movies, video games, food, social gatherings or events. Just to become silent before God. In the silence and weakness of our flesh and minds, our spirits can connect to God and know what He wants us to know. Number two. Another way to know what God wants you to do is by spending time in His Word. One of the areas of Satan's attacks is time spent with God's Word. Because we live in a fast-paced world, we want to jump in and out of the Word like we do everything else. We want short sermons, short devotionals, short Bible readings, and so on. We want quick responses for long-term needs in our lives. However, it doesn't work like that. God wants us to be committed to seeking Him in spirit and in truth. His Word is the truth that sanctifies us. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. One of the ways to know what God wants you to do in any given situation is to give yourself to His Word. Getting into the Word will do two things for you. First, it will familiarize you with God's will concerning issues of life, money, dealing with others, or dealing with your flesh and the world around you. Second, the Word of God in your heart also gives the Holy Spirit the needed tools He can use to show you God's specific will for your life. For instance, you may be dealing with a difficult colleague who is threatening you. Then you pray about it and ask God for direction. He may speak to you through a verse in the Bible like Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This could be received in your heart as God telling you, I have heard you and will take care of this situation. Just hold your peace. Don't speak to this person and don't resign. Just keep showing up and being a good employee. I will handle the rest. It doesn't concern you what He will do, but through faith and grace, you know what He wants you to do. When you obey, you will see what happens next. These are two major ways to know what God wants you to do, my friend. Now, when God responds, He can reveal His will through different means. He could use the inner witness of His Spirit in your heart, where you just feel positive and compelled to do something without knowing why. He could also use dreams or other revelations and even clear instructions through the mouth of someone else. God cannot be limited. When we play our parts, He is sure to play His part and give us the help that we need. Do you want to know God's will for you? Ask Him in prayer. Spend time in His Word. Get His Word into your heart. And then ask trusted and mature believers for counsel. When you trust God for direction, you will never get lost. It's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Are you at a crossroads, unsure if the path you're on is the one meant for you? It's easy to feel like you're navigating life's journey without a map. You might even feel that guidance is absent, and the signs you're seeking are just not there. But what if I told you that the clues you need are already being revealed to you, perhaps in ways you haven't yet recognized? You see, life has a way of sending us signals, little nudges that we're heading in the right direction. These signals might be subtle, but they are there, waiting for you to notice them. In this video, I'm going to unveil seven unmistakable signs God sends your way to affirm that you're on the right path. Number one. You're on the right track if you're getting the outcomes that will bring you to your objective, even if the process is taking longer than you expected. Picture this. You're trekking through life's intricate maze, a path riddled with twists and turns. It's akin to navigating a dense forest where every step is a leap of faith. But here's the beacon of hope. You're not just wandering aimlessly. You're heading towards a destination that resonates with your soul's purpose. The journey, albeit longer and more arduous than anticipated, is leading you closer to your divine calling. 
Consider the power of having a clear goal. It's like setting a destination in your GPS. Without it, you're merely traversing roads without knowing if they lead to your desired haven. But the moment you input that destination, every turn, every move is intentional, directed towards reaching that sacred space. The principle holds true in our spiritual journey as well. When you set your heart on a godly aspiration, be it nurturing a God-centered relationship, excelling in a vocation that glorifies Him, or simply living a life steeped in love and service, you're charting a course towards a heavenly goal. Now, let's address a common apprehension. Often the pathway to our goal seems longer than we expect. It's easy to feel disheartened, to question if we veered off course. But remember, the duration of the journey doesn't negate its validity. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 beautifully encapsulates this. He acknowledges his journey's incompleteness, the ongoing pursuit towards perfection in Christ. Paul's journey wasn't swift or straightforward, yet it was undoubtedly right. So, if you find yourself gaining insight, experiences, and virtues that align with your God-given aspirations, take heart. You're not just on any road. You're on the right road. Whether it's inching closer to a spiritually fulfilling relationship, acquiring skills for your God-honoring career, or simply growing in love and grace, these are not mere coincidences. They are affirmations from above, nudging you, encouraging you, saying, Yes, this is the way. Number two, when you are on the right track, God will allow you to go through examinations, trials, and even temptations that will benefit you. Have you ever wondered why life seems tougher when you're trying to do everything right? It's like the moment you commit to following God wholeheartedly. Challenges start coming from every direction. You might think, I'm following Jesus. Shouldn't my path be smoother? But here's the thing. Walking with God doesn't guarantee an easy journey promises a victorious one. When you're on the right path with God, it's not just a stroll in the park. It's more like being a brave warrior in a grand adventure. This journey will test your strength, faith, and resilience. Why? Because a life lived for God is lived on the front line of a spiritual battleground. Your determination will be tested. Your faith will be challenged. And yes, you might even face temptations. But here's the beautiful part. These trials are not roadblocks. They're stepping stones to greater faith and closer communion with God. Remember, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat reality. Psalm 23 tells us about walking through the darkest valley, yet not fearing any evil. Why? Because the Lord is with us. That valley isn't a detour. It's part of the path. It's in these valleys, in these moments of trial and testing, that we often find the most profound growth and see God's guidance most clearly. James chapter 1, verse 12 offers us another gem. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. This isn't just about enduring. It's about growing stronger and more steadfast in our faith. Each challenge is an opportunity to prove our faith and deepen our trust in God. And the reward? A crown of life, a symbol of eternal victory and joy. So, when life throws curveballs at you, don't lose heart. Don't interpret these valleys as signs that you're off track. On the contrary, they are indicators that you are exactly where you need to be, in the hands of God, being molded, strengthened, and prepared for something greater. Embrace these trials as evidence that you are on the right path, the path that leads to growth, strength, and ultimately a beautiful, eternal relationship with God. Number three, let's take a straightforward scenario. You're contemplating applying for a new job. It's a significant step, yes, but not a life-altering one. Here's a gentle nudge from God that might be all you need. A sense of peace, an unexpected encouragement from a friend, a verse that speaks to you during your quiet time. It's not always about earth-shaking revelations, but about the still, small voice that whispers in the quiet moments of our hearts. Now, consider a weightier decision, changing your career or moving to a new city for a job. The stakes are higher the impact more profound. In such instances, God's confirmations are often more pronounced. Could be a series of events that align too perfectly to be mere coincidences, counsel from trusted mentors, or a recurring message that resonates deeply within you. These are not just random occurrences. They are markers on the map God lays out for us, guiding us towards His plans and purposes. And then, 
There are the life-defining choices, entering a committed relationship, getting engaged, marrying the love of your life. These decisions shape not just our earthly journey, but our spiritual trajectory. Here, expect God's guidance to be even more evident. It might come through prayerful discernment, wisdom from God's Word, confirmation through the counsel of those who walk closely with Him. When the decision holds eternal significance, the signs are unmistakable. Remember, as we navigate through life's labyrinth, it's crucial to lean not on our own understanding. Our vision is limited, our perspective finite. But God, in His infinite wisdom, sees the entire tapestry of our lives. He knows every twist and turn, every peak and valley. As Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-6 through 6 urges us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and in all your ways submit to Him. He will make your paths straight. Number four, perfection is not our destination, but protection is our constant companion. This is a vital sign that God is affirming you're on the right path. Consider the rhythm of a Christian's walk. It's not about flawless steps, but about being firmly held in God's gracious grip, even amidst our stumbles. The essence of this journey is beautifully encapsulated in Psalm chapter 37, verses 23 through 24. It tells us that while we may falter, we're never forsaken. Our steps, though imperfect, are made firm by the one who delights in our sincere efforts. This path isn't about eradicating our human nature, but embracing God's nurturing nature. It's about recognizing that our missteps don't define us. Rather, it's the divine hand that continually lifts us that shapes our story. Remember, the right path isn't a straight line to perfection, but a winding road of protection and perseverance. Let's talk about growth and wisdom on this journey. Just as a tree doesn't cease to grow, neither should our wisdom and understanding. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 reminds us that being on the right path is a progressive journey towards our spiritual goals. It's not static, it's dynamic, ever evolving as we hold on to the truths we've learned while seeking new insights. Reflect on the story of the prodigal son. His journey back to his father wasn't just a physical return, but a spiritual awakening. This parable teaches us that veering off the path can lead to painful lessons, but returning to the right path brings wisdom and redemption. If we find ourselves repeating past mistakes, like the son might have, it signals that we've strayed. It's a reminder from Philippians chapter 3, verse 16 to hold true to the wisdom we've already gained. Number five. When your everyday choices reflect a heavenly purpose, it's like holding a compass where north represents God's eternal glory. Each decision you make, whether it seems monumental or mundane, is guided by this divine direction. Take a moment and consider the different roles we play in life. Some of you might be called the singlehood, dedicating your undivided attention to serving God. Others might find their calling in the joys and challenges of marriage and parenthood. Maybe you're navigating a career path or embracing the role of a stay-at-home parent. Each role, each decision, is a unique expression of your commitment to God. But here's the beautiful part. While our earthly roles may differ, our heavenly purpose remains constant. It's like a multifaceted gem reflecting the same light in different colors. The essence of our existence, as beautifully encapsulated in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, is to love God, love people, and do everything for His glory. So, how do you know you're on the right path? It's when your decisions, big or small, are infused with this eternal perspective. It's when you choose kindness over convenience, patience over haste, and love over indifference, all for the glory of God. It's when your daily life becomes a living testament to your heavenly calling. Do not forget, our paths may look different, but they're all part of a grand design, a divine narrative where every chapter, every twist and turn, is purposefully woven by God. So, as you make your choices, ask yourself, does this reflect my love for God? Does it serve His purpose? Is it a step towards eternal glory? Number six, when you are on the right path, you will attract like-minded saints and repel people who love their sin. Just as you draw nearer to those with a shared vision, you'll find others drifting away. It's not because you've changed who you are, but because you've become more of who God wants you to be. This can be tough, really tough. 
It might mean losing friends you've had for years, facing misunderstandings, or even outright hostility. Remember, Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. This is a bittersweet reality of walking with Christ. It's a sign, clear as day, that you're moving in the right direction. You're not conforming to the world, but transforming through Christ. And yes, it can be lonely. Sometimes it feels like you're walking a path few others understand. But here's the beautiful truth. You are not alone. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus prayed not just for his disciples, but for all of us, that we may be united in him. This unity isn't just a nice idea. It's a living, breathing reality in the body of Christ. As you walk this path, God is aligning you with fellow believers, a spiritual family bound together by faith and love. So when you find your circle changing, when you feel the loneliness of leaving the old path and the joy of meeting fellow travelers on the new path, embrace it. It's not just a sign, it's a divine confirmation. You are on the right path, the path that leads to life, to growth, and to an unbreakable unity in Christ. Keep walking boldly, knowing that with each step you're not just following a path, but you're living out a heavenly calling. Number seven, when we align our actions, our thoughts, our very beings with God's prescribed will, the Holy Spirit kindles a flame of peace in our hearts. It's a serene assurance, a whisper that says, yes, this is the way. Consider for a moment the two facets of God's will, the sovereign and the prescribed. God's sovereign will is like the sun's course in the sky, unchanging, unfaltering, the grand design of the universe unfolding as he has ordained. But then there's God's prescribed will, his hopes and commands for us. It's our roadmap for life, showing us how to walk in his footsteps, how to live lives that reflect his love and grace. When we veer off this divine roadmap, the Holy Spirit doesn't abandon us. Instead, he reaches out with a loving nudge, a gentle correction. It's not a thunderous rebuke, but a soft, persistent call to realign our steps. The Holy Spirit's conviction isn't about guilt or fear. It's about love, a love so deep it yearns for our return to the right path. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, speaks of a godly grief that leads to repentance and salvation. This isn't the despair of the world, but a constructive sorrow, a realization that we're strayed and a heartfelt desire to return to God's embrace. This godly grief is the Holy Spirit's way of guiding us back, of saying, my child, this isn't the way. Let me lead you back to peace. When we align with God's prescribed will, our lives may still have their share of storms and confusion, but beneath it all, there's a steady current of peace, a deep-seated knowledge that despite the chaos, we're on the right track. We're walking in step with God's will, and in this alignment, there's a joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Always keep in mind, the path to peace isn't about a life free of challenges. It's about knowing that in the midst of life's storms, you're exactly where you're meant to be, in the loving arms of God's will.